right now. And we begin with several changes out of Uvalde tonight, including a decision on the future of the Robb Elementary building itself. Uvalde's mayor saying that school will be torn down. There are also changes when it comes to the school district's police chief and city councilman Pete Arredondo. City council members voted unanimously against a leave of absence for Arredondo, and as of tonight, he has yet to appear at a city council meeting. The night team's Lee Waldman joins us now in studio. Lee, tonight's vote doesn't affect his place on the city council, but there is a change and a chance that could change. Exactly. According to the city charter, it states that if Arredondo misses three consecutive meetings, including tonight being the first one he's now missed, then they could vote whether or not to remove him from city council. Now, Uvalde's mayor, Don McLaughlin, was asked how he would vote. He said if that happened, if that vote happened tonight, he would vote to remove Arredondo. McLaughlin also expressed information on how Dis discussed rather with how information is being released. The mayor defended how the city has handled the shooting in the last four weeks. McLaughlin says information about the shooting is from DPS, the FBI, lawmakers, and the district attorney's office, not from the city of Uvalde. He says he will visit the DA's office tomorrow to find out what he can release, but people at the meeting raised concerns about graphic details getting out. The whole Later to reporters, McLaughlin said any images of dead children would not be released. McLaughlin also took a moment to call the DPS director, Steve McGraw, a liar. He says it was DPS, not him, who originally briefed the governor after this shooting. You can see the full meeting on our website. It's ksat.com. Stephania. Thank you, Lee. You know, tonight we keep learning new information when it comes to the response at Robb Elementary. Now, four weeks since that shooting, a hearing in Austin revealed this. The head of DPS says that police had enough weapons and ammunition to stop the gunman three minutes after he entered that building. DPS director Steve McGraw called the response an abject failure. The on scene commander waited for radio and rifles. Then he waited for shields. Then he waited for SWAT. Lastly, he waited for a key that was never needed. Officers were in a hallway for more than an hour while the gunman was in a classroom with children. Today, McGraw testified that the classroom door couldn't be locked from the inside and that officers apparently waited for keys without trying to open that door first. McCraw says that Pete Arredondo was the on-scene commander. Now, previously, Arredondo had said that he was unaware that he was in charge, even though the school was within his district. When asked why DPS didn't take control of that scene, McCraw says that troopers just didn't have the legal authority. You reported to Southern Spring, correct? Yes. Okay. Did you ever have to walk back your story? No. Okay. Did the governor ever, ever have to walk back his story? No. Okay. Did the president ever have to walk back his story? No. He represents grieving families, and he's had enough. We're talking tonight about two South Texas tragedies, both in small towns, both carried out with assault rifles. The biggest difference between Sutherland Springs and Uvalde, the basic facts. We continue to have a back and forth on who did what and when, even some four weeks after that massacre at Robb Elementary. So tonight, I talked to a man who has a unique perspective on both of those cases, and he calls the lack of answers in Uvalde astonishing. In Uvalde, it's the waiting and the waiting and the waiting. It doesn't seem like it doesn't seem like the story in Uvalde is that different that the truth can't come out. Is separated by four and a half years and 118 miles. Shooting scenes in Sutherland Springs and Uvalde. George Legrand has seen firsthand the pain and frustration that lingers long after a crime scene is cleared. As one of the attorneys representing the survivors from the First Baptist Church in Sutherland Springs, they had answers in 24 to 48 hours. In Uvalde, it's four weeks and counting. Is it alarming to you the lack of information coming out of Uvalde? No, there's lots of information coming out. I'm alarmed by the flip-flop all the time. The story is changing all the time. As you bury your child, 
don't know what to say. You don't, you don't have it resolved in your mind as to what happened to your child. That's terrible to me. His is from a family's view. George Legrand isn't representing anyone in Uvalde, but he does see similarities to what happened in Sutherland Springs and maybe even a link. A federal judge awarded his Sutherland Springs clients $230 million. But after the government appealed, that ruling is now in legal limbo. Two tragedies where those left behind are still searching for a little bit of closure. A little bit of closure, but they're never going to reach full closure for burying grandma or grandpa or the little, little girls and little boys at Sutherland Springs. And neither are the folks in, U in Uvalde but they are entitled to a little pieces of closure here and there, don't you think? Absolutely. So why don't we try to help them get it? So how do we help get closure? George Legrand says we keep the story alive, or maybe I should say stories. The Sutherland Springs survivors searching for justice as the Uvalde families are searching for answers. Basic facts that all sides still can't agree on. Four weeks, 21 days after 21 lives were lost. Remember their names, yes, but also continue to keep their stories alive. A group of bipartisan senators did reach a deal on gun reform. Uh, Texas Senator John Cornyn says that the deal is going to save lives. That measure would toughen background checks for young gun buyers. It would also require sellers to conduct background checks. Gun traffickers would also get stiffer penalties. However, the bill would not raise the age requirement for assault style weapons from 18 to 21. Senate members, though, still have to debate that bill before holding a vote. Now, in the meantime, here in Texas, local leaders are hoping that state leaders do something about gun reform, too. Today starts a significant process with the committees that he's called together, but we need more than talk. We need to real action. Mayor Ron Nuremberg is not giving up on demanding that Governor Greg Abbott call a special session for gun reform. Today, he signed a request for a special session with 13 other bipartisan mayors throughout Texas. They want the legislature to work on a bill that would support mental health funding and raise the age to buy assault weapons from 18 to 21. We now move to a persistent problem at the Bear County Sheriff's Office. The constant request for more money for overtime has continued for years. And today, commissioners approved another 140,000 hours of paid overtime at the jail. Sheriff Javier Salazar brought up two reasons for the need for more money, a growing jail population and staffing. When it comes to inmates, the sheriff says nearly 800 inmates should not be placed in the jail anymore. He says more than 200 inmates continue to be waiting to be transported to prison. The sheriff also says others are waiting to enter a drug treatment facility, and many of those inmates need a mental health facility. Unfortunately, in the state of Texas, we've, we've done uh, a really lousy job of building mental health beds. Uh, and we've done an outstanding job, unfortunately, I say that tongue in cheek, of, of criminalizing homelessness and mental health. Uh, we've got an over reliance on jails in the state of Texas to fix all of our problems. When it comes to staffing, the sheriff says more than 250 employees left the sheriff's office last year. So far this year, 72 people have left. He also says they've hired 120 more people with more hires expected. So what could be done to fix this? Well, commissioners have voiced some ideas like expanding tuition reimbursement programs to encourage more prospective hires. There's also a discussion of allocating funds to organizations that can help with drug treatment and mental health. The sheriff says he's also working with Alamo Colleges in hopes of encouraging even more hires. And by the way, we also continue to wait on results of the jail consultants that were supposed to come in and inspect the jail. Commissioners expect to get a review on jail operations sometime next month. Of course, we'll keep you posted. Switching gears now, I know, I know, I know it feels like we certainly got an early start this year, but today is actually the official start of summer. More of us are going to try to beat the heat by going out for a swim, so perfect time to talk about water safety. More than two dozen children have de drowned in Texas so far this year, and even people who are considered strong swimmers have also gotten into trouble. The night team's Patty Santos has the story. It just it happens suddenly. Um, in the blink of an eye, he was he was there and then he was gone. And then this photo was taken just minutes before Albert Aranda was pulled into a whirlpool in the Comal River and drowned. We should have had life jackets. I completely agree, but it just never 
it never crossed my mind because it's just such a relaxing, enjoyable time at the Kamel. Mitch Aranda says his 62-year-old dad was a water safety advocate. Water was not a fear of his at all. He could swim very well. He's sharing his family's tragedy in hopes of saving someone's life this summer. The Texas Parks and Wildlife Department reports 82 people drowned last year, compared to 70 the previous year. Texas Family and Protective Services reports 26 children have drowned so far this year. Drowning is about the second leading cause of death in children under five. Pediatrician Megan O'Brien says children need to be watched closely around water. When children do drown, it's what's called a silent drowning. They're not going to splash. They're not going to make any noise. No one's going to notice that they've gone underwater. Experts say know the signs. That includes looking for a head tilted back and watching for panic in the face. Aranda says don't let your guard down. You want to have fun. That's the main point of going to the lake or going out to the water. But your number one concern needs to be safety. Patty Santos, KSAT 12 News. Still ahead on the night beat, crowds covered the front of the Supreme Court. The countdown to a ruling on abortion is closing in now. That developing story coming up. And new information now coming to light in the search for little Lena Keel. San Antonio's police chief sitting down with KSAT in an exclusive interview tonight. That story, by the way, is coming up next right here on the night beat. Here's a question that many of you have, and that is, where is Lena Keel? Last night, we did hear from her father, and tonight, Police Chief William McManus has an update on the case. Little Lena was last seen on December 20th. Tonight, Chief McManus says that investigation has taken a slight turn. The night team's Lee Waldman brings us this case at exclusive interview. First day or today, our, our goal remains the same, and that is to try to find Lena to try to get some information as to what happened to her. 183 days. That's how long it's been since Lena Keel vanished. I mean, nobody disappears out of thin air. Something happened to her. We just haven't been able to, to discover what it was. Lena's case is baffling, even to SAPD Chief William McManus. People wonder, how far can a three-year-old actually get on her own? Shouldn't we have found her at this point if someone didn't take her? Well, I mean, that's the big mystery. Since the very start, SAPD has maintained Lena's case is a missing persons case, despite some suspicion in the community that she must have been taken. Chief McManus today says they're utilizing resources that would be used in an abduction case. We, we still don't have any evidence or proof that it was an abduction, so we still, we're, we're doing it. It's kind of a hybrid, missing person and abduction. I asked McManus why not classify Lena's disappearance as an abduction. If there were video, if there were any kind of evidence of an abduction, we would have classified it as an abduction, but since we don't have that, we can't classify it as an abduction. Originally, the missing persons unit was leading the case. Now the special victims unit has taken over. SVU will. They'll go out on the street in the field and they will interview people out there, whereas missing persons wouldn't necessarily do that. Unfortunately, as more time passes, tips about Lena have slowed significantly. Chief McManus says only a few have come in during the month of June. Does the hope of finding her alive and well start to diminish? Unfortunately, it does, uh, to be candid. Uh, we are still devoting uh, the resources necessary to locate her based on the tips we get. In this case, no piece of information is too small and all leads are being followed. If you know anything about little Lena, call the missing persons unit at 210-207-7660 or Crime Stoppers, that number for you, 210 210- 224-7867. Steve, Stephania. Lee, you have to think somebody knows something in that case. Thank you. And now for a look at your headlines in your night beat news flash. The Supreme Court announcing several rulings today. None of them involved an announcement on abortion, though. One of those rulings says religious schools cannot be excluded from Maine's tuition assistance program. Justices said excluding religious schools from Maine's voucher program violated the First Amendment. Meanwhile, outside the court, crowds of people voice their concerns on both sides of the abortion issue. A ruling that could change the future of abortion could come as early as Thursday. Flames broke out again at a popular resort in Bernie, Tapatio Springs Hill Country Resort, once owned by country music superstar George Strait. The good news in all this, no injuries reported. 
The overnight fire tore through a building that housed a spa. The cause for the fire is still under investigation. It's not the only time fires have hit this property either. Back in 2017, the clubhouse burned down forcing the resort to close for about two years. That's not going to happen this time. The rematch and now recount in Texas District 28 race. Well, it's over. Incumbent Henry Cuellar kept his lead over immigration attorney Jessica Cisneros. That lead 289 votes. It held up. This was the second time Cisneros challenged Cuellar. In a tweet today, Cisneros said, quote, change is a process and through this process, we're educating our community that we deserve better than the status quo, end quote. Now, Cuellar will face Republican Cassie Garcia in November. And that's a look at your Nightbeat News Flash. Now we're going to take things outside. Here's Sky 12 over San Antonio College, and you see that the building is uh, lit beautifully right now for Pride Month. 86 degrees out there right now. Yeah, and get ready. More heat to come until we have a weak cold front hit us, or Steve, as we like to call it, a... Less hot front. Or a not as hot front, yeah. <laughs> Either way, not as hot Fractionally front. less hot Fractionally front. Fractionally less. <laughs> you small fraction. Okay. It, yeah. Hey, fractions count, right? As, the way our summer's going, fractions are everything. Triple digits through the weekend, but then that not as hot front will hit us on Monday, and that should drop our temperatures a bit and give us a glimmer of hope for some real rain, not just these isolated pop-up teasing showers that we've had the past couple of days. Take a look at our temperature trend. We're going to get right to it. 100 tomorrow, 102 by this weekend. So record challenging. I mean, within about a degree of the record, wouldn't surprise me if we tied or even broke a record on any one of those given days. But notice that little drop down into the mid 90s by Monday and Tuesday. And actually, there is the potential here that it could be even I don't want to say cooler, but the temperature could be lower than that. There is the potential, especially as we get into Tuesday. So here's one thing we've been talking about. You know, why so hot so early this year? Well, for one, the big dome of high pressure has just been pressing down on us a little bit harder than what we had, say, this time last year. Also, the drought and that directly impacts temperatures. The drier the ground, the hotter it heats up, and the more that heat radiates into the air. Compare that to one year ago today, not one 100 degree day by this time last year, and we only had three all year. So far now today makes it 18. And look at this, no drought either. And actually by this time last year, we had over 15 inches of rain year to date. So far this year, four and a half. Drought leads to the hotter conditions as well. And the heat high, of course, playing its role, but it's also playing its role in steering some of that upper level moisture into drought stricken New Mexico and West Texas, even Arizona. At least somebody who needs rain is getting some of it. Let's fast forward with our feature cast because I talked about that front on Monday, Tuesday, that boundary that's going to move in. It gives us hope for some real showers. I'm not going to zoom in. It's too far away to do that, but notice by Monday, hope at least for some showers to pop up. I think we'll have the instability. We'll have just enough moisture in the air, and then that front should act as our trigger to lift the air and turn it into clouds, and then hopefully cross your fingers, maybe some showers and thunderstorms. As we have it right now, Monday, Tuesday, about a 20 to 30 percent chance. Tomorrow is going to be more of the same. Just a few of those uh, teasing pop up showers. Also, I do want to point out the Saharan dust currently in the Gulf of Mexico. You will notice a little bit late tomorrow, but especially on Thursday, moderate levels before it dissipates again. All right, 88 degrees right now. Dew point is 65, feels like 90. There is a front off to the north of us. It's just not going to hit us. El Paso 73, Amarillo 72. You get up into the 60s, farther north up the plains in Nebraska and the Dakotas. But around here, we're talking 80s right now. Still even 94 in Del Rio. Converse 86, Castroville at 90. We'll start the day tomorrow at 77. By the noon hour, we make it up to 92 degrees and sunny. That 10% chance tomorrow afternoon basically will be dry. 100 again for the high temperature tomorrow afternoon. We will be feeling the heat, but as I mentioned, not as hot, fractionally less hot as we get into early next week. And there will be changes to that forecast. We're going to be fine tuning it. Check back for updates. I don't care if it's fractionally. It's something. It's a, exactly. It. <laughs> 95 and 94 sound really nice right now. Sounds a lot better than 102. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, Greg, we were talking about this last night. Now we know who the Spurs are partnering up with. Yeah, and they have a new jersey sponsor. And you were talking about that little patch they wear over here. Mm -hmm. Last year it said Frost. This year we'll say Self. What is Self and where are they located? When we come back, we'll let you know about all those details. And the Aggies are still in the College World Series. Coming up. All right, 
San Antonio Spurs announcing a new jersey sponsor today is Self Financial, or just Self, that will read on the patch, an Austin-based company with credit billing technology. Josh Primo was today's jersey model as Self replaces San Antonio-based Frostbank, who chose to put their money and their name on the Rocket Lock and Terra. That's the Spurs' $500 million development on the northwest side that will include the Spurs' new training facility and state-of-the-art medical and research offices to go along with the park and community spaces. The CEO of Spurs Sports and Entertainment, R.C. Buford, on hand at the AT&T Center for today's big announcement, including self financial officials. Values alignment is first, and I think from there, it was really trying to, to help each other um, find out ways that we could in, improve and build our brands. What attracted us to the Spurs is the company's values around integrity. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to work with, and you know, we've also seen that customers uh, like the Spurs a lot, so it's just been a perfect partnership and uh, we're really excited for the future. The next order of business for the Spurs will be announcing a new naming rights sponsor for their home arena after their 20-year deal for $40 million with AT&T expired at the end of last season. That should come before this fall. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Former Texas, now Cleveland Browns quarterback Deshaun Watson has reached confidential settlements with all but four women that have filed civil lawsuits against him for his sexual assault and misconduct during massages. It's according to Houston attorney Tony Busby, who says his settlements are for 20 of the 24 lawsuits that are currently facing Watson, but Busby declined to say for what amount the lawsuits were settled for. Busby added that they're still working on the other four, looking forward to trying those cases possibly in court. Watson is not facing any criminal charges after two separate grand juries failed to indict him, but he is facing punishment from the NFL for violating the league's personal conduct policy that could include up to a year's suspension, if not more. It is unclear if the Houston Texans organization will face any punishment following a New York Times investigation that said the Texans provided Watson access to the Houstonian for some of those massages and non-disclosure agreements. The Aggies live to play another day. Next. The Fighting Texas Aggies face another elimination game as they went up against the Cinderella Story. Fighting Irish of Notre Dame in the College World Series today. No score. Top of the third inning. The Aggies have the bases loaded. The Irish bring in their star freshman Jack Finlay to get them out of a jam. And after one strikeout, the defense lets him down. Dylan Rock with a shot to the hot corner, but the throw from third to first hits the dirt. They can't dig it out. Two runs will score, including Bernie Champions Jason Thompson. And the Aggies take a 2-0 lead. It would be 3-0 following a sack fly. Top of the fifth now. Trevor Werner with the whammy. <laughs> Solo blast to left makes it four to nothing. The Aggies never look back. They get the five to one win. After Friday, I felt just terrible. Like I let my team down. But to come back and to have coach give me the ball just two games later, uh, it, all that confidence just flowed through me. When De Detmer's out there rolling and we're spending, you know, five minutes on defense, I mean, it saves a lot of energy and you get just get right back on them and keep the pressure on, you know, Notre Dame. And that's what we did all day. And I think that's what helped us be successful and get the win. All right, next up, a rematch with OU at one tomorrow. In fact, they're going to have to beat the Sooners twice in this because they've lost already once to OU, 13 to 8. So they're going to have to win tomorrow and then one more time to stay involved. All right. Thank you, Greg. Again. Crossed. We'll be right back. Right now on KSAT.com, our team takes you underground and into the Honey Creek Cave in Comal County. Some have called it a slice of paradise. The cave is under privately owned land, but we were able to get special access. You can take a look right now on KSAT.com. You know, some people cover stories. Our weather team dives right in. Oh, boy. You know what, though? It is a really cool story. So it's I a great you to story. Look at it. I yeah. love it. And I mean, Justin Horn, Sarah Spivey, they they get those connection, the hookups, you know, for those places. Like yes. Private land. And then they're they're diving in the caves underwater. At Fascinating. All right, 97 tomorrow, Timberwood Park, 96 Bernie, Lake Hills about 101, Elmendorf 100, and a few degrees warmer as we get into the weekend, then some changes early next week. We'll keep you updated on those. All right, Thank so you, Adam. And that does it for the night beat. We'll see you at 430.